Let's see an example of conjoint analysis being performed in the Ingenious software platform. In this presentation, we're going to understand how to apply conjoint, a conjoint study within Ingenious. We're going to identify key conjoint design decisions within the Ingenious interface. We're going to look at some of the key output and interpret that output. And we're going to recognize some of the limitations of conjoint analysis within Ingenious. It's important to keep in mind that while we're focusing on using conjoint analysis in Ingenious in this presentation, we are going to be talking about conjoint analysis more generally the whole time. In other words, even if you're not using Ingenious, all of the decisions that we'll be making here are consistent with the kind of things that we think about when designing any type of a conjoint study. When performing a conjoint study, there's a variety of steps that we have to do before we're ready to go. First, we're going to have to determine the baseline product that we're going to present to individuals. By baseline, I mean the features of the product that we aren't actually including in our study, but we have to describe to the respondent so they understand the product, service, or experience that we're talking about. Then, we have to figure out which attributes and levels within those attributes of the product that we're actually going to be studying in the conjoint experiment. These are the things that we'll be manipulating and seeing how people respond to them. Next, we'll secure a fair, representative sample of the consumer or business market for the market population that we wish to generalize the results onto. Finally, we'll develop the product profiles or combinations that we'll actually include in the experiment. This is the mixture of attributes and levels that we'll be studying. There's some optional features as well, and we'll illustrate the use of all of those in this presentation. We're going to have to determine the competitive set. This can include our own product, since a new product that we introduce into the market could cannibalize our own business. We're also going to introduce an idea of incremental revenue. The idea here is that as we alter different attributes and different levels of those attributes of a product, we may not anticipate making the same amount of money because it may cost us more money to make certain levels. We can account for that in our model simulations. If we have existing market share stats from the competitors or our own products, we can incorporate that information as well. We're simulating how the new product will enter the market and what market share it'll capture. Finally, if we wish, we can design our, prod our simulation in such a way that we can set specific hypothetical product combinations and we can implement those into the hypothetical market to estimate market share. It's important to have a well-defined set of baseline features. In this scenario, we're designing a new cooler that we're going to be bringing to market. Some of the baseline features that we're not altering in this experiment is the fact that we're having a $50 price point regardless of the features of the product. It has a carrying handle on top and size with a drain plug, and it's going to be a navy blue or tan color scheme. Where do these baseline features come from? Well, the first one might be because management said so. In other instances, there are certain features of products that we simply know are must-haves. For example, if we were designing a new phone, we know that we're going to have to include a touchscreen. There's very, very, very few consumers out there who truly do not want a touchscreen phone these days. Or we might have some previous research or information about how to specify a certain level of a product so we don't actually want to include it in our conjoint experiment. The reason we show these baseline features during our study is that we want to make sure that the person responding to our experiment understands what they're evaluating. This is one way that we increase something called mundane realism in our conjoint experiment. Next, and perhaps one of the most important steps in, the, in a conjoint study design, is to figure out the attributes that we'll be investigating and what levels to set them at. These are the things that we're going to be altering. In the language of experimental design, these are our independent variables. In this new cooler design conjoint study, there's four attributes that we're investigating. Storage size, 24 can, 36 can, or 48 can. The cooling length of the cooler, two day, four day, or seven day. The warranty, a 90 day limited warranty, or a one year, no question asked warranty. And finally, the construction material, whether it's a soft top cooler or a hard top cooler. Where did these attributes come from and how did we set the levels at a particular way? First, we only study those attributes that we think that we actually have discretion in altering them in our product design itself. In addition, we should only be studying those attributes that we already have a theory, hypothesis, or belief that they will in fact have a substantial impact on consumer preference. Another motivation for including an attribute within our conjoint experiment is that altering the different levels of the attribute may have drastic cost implications for us when we design the product. Looking at the size of the cooler, we can already anticipate that delivering a 48 can storage size cooler for $50 is going to cost us quite a bit more than a 24 can option, also at $50. Finally, it's also important to keep in mind that the levels of the attributes that we're studying are all reasonable. And by reasonable, I mean we understand that they fit within the boundaries of consumer expectations. That's why we're not studying a cooler that has a storage size of 6,000 cans. 
Next, it's important to keep in mind that we need to study a fair representative sample of the population that we want to project our results onto. In our case, we studied 85 respondents who plan on buying a cooler in the next 12 months, plan on buying from a sporting goods store, and is willing to spend over $40 for a cooler on the West Coast. Why do we make these choices? Well, in this scenario, we're a sporting goods manufacturer who already has established retail distribution channels for regional retailers in Oregon, Washington, and California. In different settings, we may have had different, entirely different criteria for what we would define as our market. With our sample selected, our attribute and level selected, it's now time to develop the product profiles for this experiment. Since we have four attributes, one with three levels, another with three levels, and the other two with two levels, that means there's 36 possible combinations of coolers that we might study. We already know that it'd be rather exhausting to ask any one person to evaluate all 36 combinations. We can use a fractional factorial design, or orthogonal experimental design, to reduce the number of these 36 options into something more manageable, rather than study all 36 options, each participant in our experiment will only evaluate these nine specific versions of the cooler. Even though we'll only find out their preference for each of these nine versions, we will be able to estimate or their preference for all 36 versions. In the language of an experiment, a conjoint experiment would be called a within subjects repeated measures fractional factorial experiment, or at least this one is designed that way. Unfortunately, Ingenious doesn't actually tell us exactly how to set up the reduced number of profiles when collecting data. There's a variety of software packages that'll perform fractional factorial design or orthogonal experimental design for us. Finally, it's time to implement the experiment. And as always, the rule garbage in, garbage out entirely applies. The quality of the results that we're going to be deriving from this experiment or is entirely contingent on the, on the degree to which the respondent gives an honest, accurate answer to all of their preferences for each of the nine cooler options. We know that there's no way that a conjoint experiment will be perfectly mapped onto the real-world purchase scenario of a, a respondent. However, there are a variety of things that we can do to try to increase the mundane realism of our experiment. Mundane realism, in the context of experimental design, simply, being, simply means making decisions on how we design the experiment to make it more realistic or more consistent with the real world. For example, with respect to the actual stimuli of the experiment, an example of low mundane realism would be to provide only a written description of the features of the cooler. It'd be entirely up to the respondent to imagine what the cooler looks like and imagine the context that it sits within. That's very inconsistent with what real marketplace conditions are like. Now, an example of high mundane realism we'd have actual physical prototypes of each version of the cooler, packaged as they would be on a store shelf. In this real-world experiment, people would actually be able to handle, hold, touch, look at, and inspect the real cooler. This is much more consistent with shopping in a sporting goods store. In addition, sometimes we manipulate how we use experimental incentives. In other words, how we compensate individuals to participate in our experiment to make sure that mundane realism is high. On the low end, maybe we don't offer people anything. We simply say your honest answers will help us design products you might like to buy. While that may motivate some people, that's not exactly how purchase decisions work. But consider this. For high mundane realism, we might tell the respondent that at the end of the study, they will have the option of taking home the cooler that they like the most, or they could take $20 in compensation. While this isn't exactly the same thing as making a purchase, you can see here how it really incentivizes the individual to think hard about those, about those options that are presented to them, and rather than actually purchasing a cooler, they could instead take a gift of $20, which is somewhat akin to them leaving money in their actual wallet rather than making a purchase. This drastically improves mundane realism and adds credibility to the results of our experiment. The data from the experiment that you're going to be seeing in this presentation was derived from, from an experiment that had rather low mundane realism. This would be one example of the kind of stimuli that was presented to our respondents. A brief blurb, pricing and location, an app an image that gives an idea of the cooler, and then the features were prominently shown and colorized in red. Now that we've collected the data, it's time to enter it into our software. In Ingenious, data is organized in what's called a long format. That is, each, each respondent has all of their answers for each of the nine combinations distributed across nine different rows. Here, you can see the first of our 85 respondents and their answers to the nine different combinations of coolers. Their ratings are captured here on the far right-hand side. Our dependent variable was measured from 0 to 100, with 100 being the highest preference score.